do we really have to worry about donating blood every few months due to higher hematocrit? And if this is your first time here, make sure to subscribe so you can learn more about fitness and nutrition, hormones and anti-aging, all this to optimize your life overall. And hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything. So how do you go about that in the UK, Sam, uh, Mike? Yes, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, the, we don't see a lot of it, to be honest, but there are some guys that, that have it. I mean, the, the evidence is, uh, you know, uh, that actually it's not as, as long as you're not getting a raise of like platelets and all these other things that, that are happening, it's, it's, it, it's, it's not much of an issue. But in terms of what the doctors, again, how they're monitored and restricted, if, they, if someone was to see a high hematocrit and hemoglobin, you know, and, and this person, for example, I don't know, experience high blood pressure or, or, or something else you know that would be something that they would focus on so I think even if the doctor because you know we do have this even if the doctor doesn't again we, they, they, they can't often utilize international evidence right and you know, if they if they have a high hematocrit hemoglobin it's usually recommended donate a pint of blood you know it's a good thing to do maybe just do it on a on a, on a basis and until sort of things level out but yeah well and for those men who the NHS uh, won't draw the blood for then the, we have a private service that we, we work with a private um, company that will draw the blood for the patient. Um, we have like a, we have the it's not the Red Cross. It's like the NHS give blood service. But um, they'll say if the hematocrit's too high, people can't donate. If they're on HCG, they say you can't donate, and so then that usually becomes a real problem. So we have to help arrange for the right service for them to um, to be able to have a pint taken mm -hmm. and disposed of, which is a, is a waste really. But they don't want that in the blood supply. So I think that's the thing. I think it has to happen here, basically, because doctors feel like they must, um, even if they don't fully agree with the evidence behind it. I mean, I think a lot of them agree with Dr. Neil Rousseau's uh, analysis. You know, there are people in high altitudes, you know, that have just a secondary erythrocytosis, not necessarily um, polycythemia, which always gets conflated. Um, we've heard of um, a couple of patients that had gone to hematologists because they were a bit worried about the high hematocrit hemoglobin, especially you know, some that were applying for life insurance policies. And so they had to be put through the ringer through all these different tests when there was just secondary erythrocytosis to finally say, okay, you're, you're right. I mean, one hematologist told one of our clients that, all right, unless your hematocrit is 60 or 60%, you know, we don't usually worry too much. That was shocking, really, that come from an NHS hematologist. Yeah. But, um, but I mean, the other things like, you know, do you have sleep apnea? has TRT uncovered a sleep apnea that you may have had that was mild. You know, those sort of things obviously are, are, are you know, checked as well. But um, So in some ways it's a good guide almost a canary in the coal mine with the, with the hematocrit going up because that gives the doctor the chance to ask if there is an issue with these things and then try to get them to having a you know, CPAP or at least a sleep study. Okay, Keith, uh, is there a certain number that you use in the US to say now is the moment you have to draw blood? I haven't run into that that yet, I, you know. So we we don't really run into that problem. Mine runs fifty four point seven. That's what mine last time I checked it fifty four point seven automatic rate. But I think mean, you know the, it's one of the beneficial effects of testosterone to increase that oxygenation. That's why you can give it to a, a diabetic with with ulcers and heal those ulcers. So uh, you know we don't bleed COPD guys. We don't bleed people at altitude. We don't you know bleed uh, sleep apnea people with you know anytime you're. In a hypoxic environment, you know, you're going to compensate by increasing red blood cell mass. And uh, but you know, with testosterone, same way. It's just once again that a lot of the doctors, and I understand why they do it. They're, they're it's a route, you know, CYA. Of course it is, and that's what they're doing there. And you can't blame them for that. So they 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 play along. The problem is, is that I see a lot of guys that come in for the initial consult that have been on testosterone, and they're still extremely fatigued. Um, you know, they don't they don't feel well. And when you look at them, they're, they have iron deficiency anemia, but the testosterone levels look great, but they're losing all the benefits while bleeding themselves every month or two. And yeah. So we, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think our doctors are quite happy if they want to give blood because it's a nice thing to do. And if they give so many donations, the ones that are required by the normal blood donation centers, they get a free, I think, a special dinner at the end of the year. And it's a nice thing to do. So through the normal way. But if they're giving more therapeutic phlebotomy on a regular, regular basis, just to get it down to a certain number. And I know because I had to go through this when I, um, when I was in, in America, one of my doctors wasn't very comfortable with where my hematocrit was, about 54, 55, around there. I think it even changed seasonally. And made me go to get thera therapeutic phlebotomy from the American Red Cross. And it was just like, it's just it's strange. I mean, 
It does. It does. Uh, well, I tell all my, uh, you mentioned, you basically said what I tell every one of my patients. We're having this talk about the erythrocytosis, which is one of the risks of testosterone, if you call it a risk, but we still talk about it. Uh, but I'll tell them that, you know, if you want to go give blood to the Red Cross, because you're a good guy and you just want to donate, then, then great for you. I mean, I think everything about that. But if you think you need to go donate blood because you're on testosterone, you don't. There's lots of worry and, and fear uh, out in the, in the forums and the TRT community about it. And it's, um, you know, I think every case is, is different. But in general, uh, I learned to just, after that episode of giving all the blood, you know, that was probably about 10 more years ago, I just said, you know what, I'm, I'm doing fine. And, you know, I, I think I gave blood once just because it was a nice thing to do about four years ago. Well, when we measure their CBC, if they've got a hematocrit, 54, 55, and you know, you'll tell them this is what it is. This is what it's from. It's from the testosterone. It's the testosterone. But if this number makes you uncomfortable, go donate. Yeah. Go donate if you're uncomfortable with that. And because the opposite is if you have low testosterone, you're more likely to have anemia anyway. So it's actually a good thing that it increases erythropoietin and increases red. Oh. So, yeah.